Father, we thank you for your word that is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. Father, I pray that, Lord, that it, may, that it may speak to us, it may speak to our hearts, it may speak to our circumstances, it might speak to our lives, it might bring encouragement where there is discouragement, hope where there is despair, strength where there is weakness, and joy where there is sorrow. Father, I pray that, God, as we share your word this this afternoon, that Lord, the entrance of your word would bring light and bring understanding even to the simple. We bless you and we thank you for the privilege of breaking bread together today. I pray that Lord, you will speak through me. I pray that Lord, you will open our hearts to receive not from man but from you, that you and you alone may be glorified. We give you thanks and we give you praise for this. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 You may have your seats. You may have your seats. I just want to begin by introducing uh, my family. Uh, but as I do that, also I want to say Happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day. <laughs> when I'm Happy Mother's Day back to me, sour. <laughs> but turn to a mother next to you, uh, turn to a sister there, aspiring mothers, and just say to them, Happy Mother's Day. Uh, today I'm privileged to have two very important ladies in my life. Amen? Uh, one of them mothered me, and the other one is the mother of my children. And so I want to ask uh, the Ewagatas, the two Ewagatas. We call the senior one most misses. <laughs> uh, Amelia Ewagata, that's my mother. And my wife, Rose Ewagata. I'll ask my children also to stand up right next to their grandmother. That's Jeremy and Zoe. Our eldest is not here. And as Omea Ngambo, yo pande ingine a Nairobi. Si Ngambo ile ingine. Yeah, so you may have your seats. Uh, again, happy Mother's Day. Um, I grew up in Deliverance Church. I know some of you may not believe it, but I grew up in Deliverance Church. Uh, Isili. And we have served together from the time of Bishop to missing. Uh, we would come here and go with Bishop Kimani to go and minister in, in various places, lead worship here for the Keshas when we were still meeting in one of the, what is now one of the classrooms. <laughs> All right? That's where, that's where the church began. Uh, or rather, continued from here, it began across this side, Apo Capital Station. So I have the history, correct? Well, Right across where the, where the shell is, just a little ahead before the junction to Mirema Drive, that is where the church began. Okay? And God has been faithful, and so we just want to acknowledge uh, Mama Faith uh, for working with us. We are a product of uh, their investment in our lives. So I think we came here when we were still single. We didn't even know if we would date. Then we realized, so ni kamambia tutembea pamoja. And we've been married for 24 years now, uh, by God's grace. Amen. I want to share with us on the subject and trust. When we read this scripture in 2 Timothy chapter 2, one word that sticks out in verse, chapter 2 verse 2 is the word Paul writes to Timothy and says to, them, says to him, You then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, and trust, do what? And trust to reliable men who will also be qualified to teach others. And trust to other reliable men who will also be qualified to teach others. The word and trust is not just about leaving something to somebody. It's about looking for somebody who qualifies, who can be able to manage that resource that they have been given and you feel they are competent enough. And so it's not just throwing out something to somebody. He says, you know, first of all, investigate who the person is. Are they trustworthy? Because somebody who is trustworthy then can be entrusted with such an important assignment as taking the gospel to the next generation. Amen? Amen? And so Paul speaks to Timothy, and that word he says to him, entrust to other faithful men. What is the background of this book? Um, the author 
Of course, we've heard is Paul. In chapter 1, verse 1, it's very clearly stated that Paul is the author. And he introduces himself as such. Paul, an apostle of Christ, according to the promise of life, uh, uh, by the will of God, according to the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus. And then he introduces the recipient of the letter to Timothy, my dear son. Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. And so we see Paul is writing to Timothy. And it says that Paul wrote the book of 2 Timothy, possibly as one of his last letters while he was in a Roman prison cell, just before his death in AD 67. By this time, there was an emperor called Nero who had come into power in AD 54. But Nero was not just the regular emperor. He was actually going mad. By the time he was getting to the 10th year of his reign, he was going literally, alikuwa na cheesy. So he was losing his mind. And then in AD 64, something drastic, something bad happens in Rome, and Rome catches fire. And literally more than half the city is engulfed in fire and consumed. And Nero, in his anger, rather than fix the problem in the, in the city, decides to take it out on a victim, and that victim was the church. And so persecution began, and Paul gets caught up in that and is arrested and put in prison in Rome, awaiting the judgment and ultimately his beheading. And so at this time when Paul is in this prison, he begins to write this letter, knowing that this is possibly one of his last communications with the world of believers out there. But he's not writing it from a place of discouragement. He's writing it from a place of, I've done work and I've finished some great work and there are people who I know can be able to carry on the work that I have begun. So what's the mood and context of, of Rome at this time and the church at this time? First thing that we see is that there is persecution. It's not an easy time to be a believer. People who are being arrested... People's properties were being confiscated. People were being blamed. Basically, Nero said the Christians burnt down Rome. And so if you can find a Christian, arrest them, take them to the, police, to the police station, throw them in prison, and do whatever you want. Things were volatile. Nobody knew what tomorrow held. You could be in a meeting today praying and thanking God because of what he has done, and tomorrow you are in prison, waiting trial waiting your ultimate death. There was uncertainty. And you see, many times when you talk about Jesus is coming back, this is a major announcement in deliverance churches. One, number one announcement, Jesus is coming back. You always have to remember that. Jesus is But when the things become this thick and you begin to ask yourself, how long will it take for Jesus to come back? Because things seem to be falling apart. And it's, it's seen often in history that there are moments of deep despair and deep pain and deep darkness in the, in the seasons of the church to the point where people are saying, Lord, surely, come back now. There's uncertainty. There's complexity. There are so many th things fighting for the attention of the believer. On one point, you're told you need to be able to succeed. On the other one, you're being persecuted. On the other hand, you don't know what the, the, the mad leader is going to wake up and say tomorrow. And there's ambiguity. There is no end. There is no middle ground. There is no beginning. We don't know what will happen next. Some people who were arrested decided they're abandoning the faith just to be let go. And you're wondering, is this faith really worth living for? Have you ever been in a place like that? And so Paul writes what is possibly his last words. In chapter 4, verse 6 to 9, it says, I'm already being poured out like a drink offering. And the time has come for my departure. Think about Timothy receiving this letter from his mentor, literally his father in prison, because Paul just didn't relate with Timothy as a member of the congregation. He knew him from the village. He knew his grandmother, he knew his mother, and he knew him and had worked closely with him. Imagine Timothy receiving this letter, telling him, I'm now being ready to be pour being poured out like a drink offering. The time for my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all those 
who have longed for his appearing. This is not the kind of letter any one of us wants to receive. Because there's always a sense of hope. You know, God is going to deliver you. And possibly they are remembering certain scenarios like when Paul and Silas were in prison and the, the believers were praying and they began to sing and the prison doors were opening. But to receive a letter that says, it looks like it's time. It's scary. And Timothy therefore receives this letter in the midst of this calamity that is going on and seeing the resigning note in his father, in his mentor, in his master's, in his teacher's voice, as he says, I'm being poured out like a drink offering. And Paul, rather than talk about many things, puts this statement right in the center of 2 Timothy and says to him, listen, this is what I want you to do. The things you have heard me, forget about where I am, forget about the circumstances, the things you've heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, the teachings I have delivered, do this, pick them all, and then trust them to other faithful men who are reliable men and women who will be able to pass it on to the next and the next. You see, God is a generational God. Every time he thinks, he does not think about one generation. He thinks about the next generation. One generation shall commend his works to another. You see, Paul is telling Timothy to do this because he who teaches learns twice. Every time you take a story you've had or a, a lesson you've learned and you go and explain it to somebody else, it brings clarity to you. Because now it means you've not just heard it, but you are able to explain it in your own words to somebody else. So he who teaches learns twice. He who takes what they have heard and explains it to another gets a better understanding just by the process of saying, I have something to say about what I have heard. They learn more. He who gives earns twice. It's more blessed to give than to receive. The moment I take time to release to somebody else what I have received, then I get the opportunity to receive more. But if my hands are full, then I cannot give. The reason why a river has fresh water and a place like the Dead Sea has salted water that no life can, can stay is because the river keeps passing on the water. It never holds the water. And the moment there's a blockage in a river and it becomes stagnant, the next thing that happens is that the water begins to smell. It begins to breed algae. The next thing, it begins to become poisonous. And so the health of the river is in passing forward what it has received. Freely you have received. Freely give. He who serves loves twice. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to offer his life as a ransom for many. The underlining scripture of the gospel, John 3.16, says, God so loved the world that he did what? Gave his own son. It's an act of service. It's an act of saying, I do not deserve to come and stand as the boss, but I come and wash the feet of them that I need to save. He who serves loves twice. You see, discipleship is not just about what you hear. It's more importantly, what you do. But many times we want to wait for the big stage. We want to build capacity. And we are always feeling like, I'm not ready. I'm not ready. I'm not ready. And somebody says this, do it afraid, but do it anyway. Do it afraid, but do it Anyway, sing that song. <laughs> sing it afraid, but sing it anyway. Write that proposal. You may never have written a proposal. Write it. Nobody who, the first person who wrote a proposal had no script. But they wrote it anyway. And the moment you take that step, God will accompany you on it. 
Explain that lesson. If you, are, if you, if you know a bit about English, get a, a person who has come from the village who does not know English and explain to them the little you know. And the moment you do that, you begin to gain clarity and understanding of that thing that you have shared. But the moment you sit with it and say, I'm just waiting to upload, 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 you are like somebody who says, Watch a nikule kwanza ni kule ni kule ni kule ni jenge. And after that, niende ni the gym. After six years, the kukula. Ni chongeyo six pack. It doesn't work like that. Ferdinand Omanyala did not say, I'm going to run 100 meters. I'll be the fastest man in Africa. Like, no, he ate and he practiced. He ate and he exercised. He disciplined himself. He chose what to eat. He began to put into practice until he lowered his time probably from 15 seconds, 14, 13, 12, 10, 9. Why? Because he's not just waiting for the big stage when he's going to be running on a continental race. He's beginning to work out, running against a classmate, running against another school, running for his county, then running for the nation. And suddenly you find yourself running for the continent. But if you wait for the continental stage, Nangoja squile bishop pataniambia nisimame kwa madhabahu. Niangushe neno, nimekua nikijitayarisha. Kuna mtu amekusikia? Why should we give it to you? David had fought many battles before he stood before Saul to say there was. And anywhere you go in this world, people ask for experience. David said, I've fought against a lion and killed it. I've fought a bear and killed it. And therefore, this uncircumcised Philistine will be no match. But I don't think David started with lions and bears. Probably started with some little animals that he fought here and there. A little fox that ruins the vineyard. Started with, you know, chasing the monkeys. And then he realized, you know what? I know some skills that can survive me in a battle with a bigger animal. So don't wait for the big giant to slay. Slay the small ones. Song of Solomon's 2.15 says, catch for us the little foxes. The little foxes that ruin our vineyards. Our vineyards that are in bloom. Some of the things that you need to overcome before you come to overcome the big things are tiny things, insignificant battles that nobody will recognize you for. But they are necessary to build the ability. Four things I want to share with us in the process of entrust, why, why the process of entrusting is important. Number one, Paul speaks to Timothy and speaks about the encountering that he has had, a sincere faith. Chapter 1, verse 4 to 5, he says, Recalling your tears, I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy. I am reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois, in your mother Eunice, and I'm persuaded now lives in you also. He talks about a sincere faith. A faith that is genuine. A faith that, you know, I know I believe in God and I love God. It's not just about attending a service. It's a, yeah, do you have a sincere faith? Being emotional is not equal to being spiritual. Being emotional is not the same as being spiritual. Sometimes you can find the people who are loudest here are the ones who are rudest just down the road. <laughs> is your faith sincere? Are you who you are here and there? It takes a sincere faith. Number two, and I've, I've put this down in, in present continuous tense, encountering, not just encounter, but are you constantly encountering Christ? Are you constantly asking yourself, am I in the right standing with my God? Number two is empowering, empowered by the Holy Spirit. Verse 6 to 7, Paul writes to Timothy and says, for, I, for this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God did not give us a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power, of love, and of sound mind or self-discipline. And the question that I want to ask us is, what drives you? Are you driven by the Holy Spirit? Are you filled with the Holy Spirit? Are you stirring up the gifts that are in you by the power of the Spirit? Now, Paul knew that Timothy was a timid guy, and so he encouraged him. He says, do not, do not step back. 
You've not been given a spirit of fear. Fear is not a fruit of the Holy Spirit. Why? Because many times we, we shun doing something because we are afraid. And Paul knows that Timothy will be the kind of leader who might say, I, I don't think I'm competent enough. I'm not ready for it. Paul is saying, you know what? There's no time to be ready. It's either you are ready and I'm gone because I'm already going. What drives you? Are you empowered by the Holy Spirit? Number three, enduring hardship. You see, Paul is not unaware of the difficulty of the journey around him, the Timothy, of the journey around the church at the time. And when he's speaking to them, he's saying, I know the circumstances. I mean those circumstances because I am sitting in prison as I write this. And you are hardship with us like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. Verse 4, it says, no one serving as a soldier gets involved in civilian affairs. He wants to please his commanding officer. Similarly, anyone who competes as an athlete does not receive the victor's crown unless he competes according to the rules. So three things here. Number one, endure hardship like a good soldier. Seek not to be involved in civilian affairs. Even when we are handling ordinary things of this world, doing business, don't do them like the ordinary man. When you are dating, don't date like the ordinary person. In your marriage, let it not be the same as the ordinary marriage. Let people look and say, surely Christians have good marriages. <laughs> because you don't want to indulge yourself in civilian affairs. Compete according to the rules. Third thing. Compete according to the rules. There are certain things that govern our work as believers. And we want, we want to be able to exemplify them everywhere we go. You see, discipleship takes discipline. And sometimes we don't like the road of chastisement. We want God to just love us as we are. And somebody says, yes, God calls us to come just as we are. But it would be brutal for him to leave us just as we were. It is the, the greatest miracle of all is that a man who was once in darkness, was once blind, was once lost, was once wicked and wretched, suddenly stands up and says, I once was that, but now I am alive. Now I do not do the things that I used to do. If that change has not happened for a believer, then we need to question whether salvation has really happened. Enduring hardships. Number four, exemplifying. Distinguishing yourself. Chapter 2 verse 20 says, In a large house there are various vessels. Vessels of different, not only of articles of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay. Some are for special purposes and some for common use. Those who cleanse themselves from the latter will be instruments for special purposes, made holy, useful to the master, and prepared to do any good work. So here is a scenario Paul is painting. He's saying a, in a house there are different vessels. There are vessels that when you see them being removed, you know today serious people are coming. Now, if you grew up in the traditional home, my mother is here. She had some fine china that was kept in a particular drawer. That drawer was even sacred just because those utensils are there. You didn't touch them. However, dirty all the other utensils were, these were not touched. All right? But when you saw her cooking, and the food was also different, machapo, makuku, you know, and all bilau, and then you see those dishes coming out, just know that day, things are going to be different. I don't know if you have parents like those. I don't know if you experienced that. Mukoneza masani. Wengina tamjoi to me ampaka leo. Bado ziko hapo. Now they have gone to shags. Because they were special use vessels. Why? Because they were valuable. Because they were set aside for the important occasions. Now the question is, are you an ordinary vessel or are you an exemplary vessel? That question is not God's to answer. It's you. It says, if a man cleanses himself. Not if God cleanses you. It says they are vessels. But if a man cleanses himself, then he will be a vessel of noble use, ready for any exceptional use by God. When God needs a man, I say, I need a man in Mirema. 
I need a man in Rishambu. I need a man in Zimmerman. Where is a man? And he looks around. Will he find you looking exemplary? I'm not saying that you are to help you. Fagia, fagia. That question is answered by you. How do I become a, noble, a vessel of noble use? 2 Timothy 2.15 says, Study to show yourself an approved workman who rightly handles the word of truth. Now, many times we think about this to be exceptionally about studying the Bible to become a teacher of the word. But it's not just about that. It's study in whichever field God has placed you. If you're a teacher, if you're a designer, if you're a carpenter, if you're a mechanic, if you're a doctor, say study to show yourself approved. A workman who rightly handles. So as a teacher, I need to be so good that you teach a student and finally, even that foolish student is like, Malimu Leo, imeingia. <laughs> Study to show yourself. That is how you become, move from ordinary use vessel to a, you know, a vessel of noble use. The third thing that happens to be exemplary, Paul says to Timothy, flee, verse 22, Flee from the evil desires of youth and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace along with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Now, the reality is that we need to select our company. For us to be able to be exemplary, you need to be able to walk in different companionship. And there are people who encourage you. I remember growing up as a teenager and these two friends of mine who encouraged me, one, to start singing, two, to begin to study the word of God, three, to be able to grow and encourage others in the faith. Now, there were many, various different young people around me, but these two captured me because they seemed to have a desire to call on the Lord out of a pure heart, and that made the whole difference in my life. You can have the calling of God, you can have the gifts of God, you can have the, the desire to serve God, but if you're in the wrong company, it can mess it all up. All these believers were given the same call. All of us have the same call. We are called to be priests, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God. All of us. But what have you done to exemplify yourself, to be a vessel of noble use? We have been given the same commands. But then at the end of the day, you see different levels, different expressions. And we do this even in our normal day. When you think about a tailor, what have you done? Say, this one is of ordinary use, this one is of noble use. You're acting like your heavenly father. You know who is exceptional, and you know who is ordinary. What is the journey to move from sincere to genuine? And I want to finish with this. Number one, Paul says to Timothy, do not be afraid. Chapter 1, verse 7. Do not be afraid. Read chapter 1, verse 7. Chapter, number two, do not be ashamed. Number three, do not be selfish. This is where Paul says, whatever you have learned from me, and trust to other faithful men. Number four, do not compromise. Do not, be, do not entangle with civilian affairs. Number five, do not be lazy. Study to show yourself an approved workman. Number six, do not be common. Be a vessel of noble use. Number seven, do not walk alone. Walk along with those who are calling on the Lord out of a pure heart. Let me conclude with this. Do you have a sincere faith? Are you empowered, filled, and driven by the Holy Spirit? Are you walking in discipleship and discipline? Are you exceptional in your walk with God and in your use of the gifts and opportunities God has entrusted to you? Are you waiting to be used or are you already entrusting what the little you've had to other faithful men and women. Because as I said, the journey to becoming exceptional is not just about waiting for that moment. It's practicing what you have. The little you have, God is saying, put it in another person's hand and I'll put more in your hands.
Let's bow down and pray. Father, I thank you and I bless you for your word. Lord, I pray that you would speak to us. Lord, there are some of us who have amazing gifts, but we are waiting for a moment. We are afraid. We are not sure it is ready. We feel like there's a moment or a season for us to come up. Yet, Lord, every day you give us opportunities to exercise the gifts we have. Lord, some of us may have tried at one point and failed or felt they have failed or been laughed at or been discouraged and we've hidden that gift and said, I can't use this gift because it's not pleasant in my last experience. Father, I pray let your spirit speak to our hearts and to our lives. Lord, there may be some people here who have amazing gifts that you have set in their hearts. But Lord, because of fear, because of doubts, because of anxieties about what the future holds for them, they have hidden those gifts and they have taken what every other ordinary person is taking. And they have denied themselves the opportunity to shine as a vessel for noble use, ready for every good work. Lord, I pray let your spirit speak to us as we are praying today. I feel there's some of us who are here and you, you have certain gifts God has given you. God has entrusted you with so much, but you're afraid to pass it on to somebody else because you don't feel ready yet. You're afraid to stand up and do that which God has given you to do. And God is saying to you, put that gift in my hands. Stir up that gift. Fan it into flame. It's already there. It's already provided. You have everything it, you need and everything it takes to make that gift shine. But do not, do not be afraid. And so, Father, we bow before you. From whom every good and perfect gift comes from. And we pray, Lord, may we not deny ourselves, may we not deny the world, the gifts that, Lord, you've given to us, but, Lord, may we exemplify them. May we, may we set them on fire. May we look to you and say, God, here are the gifts you've given me and allow you to use them for your glory. I surrender all to you. Everything I give to you. I surrender. I surrender all to you. Everything everything I give to you withholding nothing withholding nothing withholding nothing Lord withholding nothing withholding nothing withholding nothing withholding nothing, withholding nothing. Oh, I surrender I 
I give you all of me. I give you all of me. I give you all of me. I give you, Lord, I give you all of me. I give you all every gift, Lord, I give you. I give you my life. I give you my strength. I give you my weaknesses. I give you all. I give you all of me. I give you, Lord. I give you all. I give you all of me. I give you all. So I surrender. I surrender all to you. Everything, Lord. Everything I give to you. Withholding nothing, withholding nothing. Everything I lay at your feet, Lord. Withholding nothing, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. So if you're here and you're saying, God, I need you to change my life. I've lived in fear. I've been afraid to allow you. I've been afraid to step up and use that gift because I'm waiting to be ready. I'm waiting to be better. I'm waiting to be stronger. I'm waiting for a bigger platform. Whatever the excuse, God is saying to you today, start where you are. Start with what you have. Win the small battles. The big ones will come. Don't be ashamed. Don't hold it back to yourself. Don't feel like it's not worth it. Don't be lazy about it. Work on it. Sharpen that gift. Stir up that gift. If you're here and you're saying, I know God has given me certain gifts, but I've been sitting on them. Just put up your hand. You're praying. Just put up your hand. You're saying, I know God has given me certain gifts, but I've held them back for whatever reason. Maybe some have mentioned, some I haven't. But you're saying, I know I have a gift to the church and to the world, but I've held it back. I want you to just leave it to God today. Father, I thank you and I bless you. Give you honor for these hands lifted to you. Lord, as we surrender all to you, as we surrender, Lord, our fears, our anxieties, our doubts, our uncertainties, let your spirit speak. Let your spirit lead. Let your spirit open a way for us to walk in the fullness of the gifts and abilities that you've given us. That Lord, we can entrust to others that which you have so faithfully entrusted to us. We give you glory and we give you honor in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. God bless you.